everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us here with our celebrations and the Ecological City Art and Climate Solutions Action Project. We have so many amazing artists who've been part of this project for many years, as well as local experts who will speak about sustainability solutions um, on the Lower East Side, from the gardens to the waterfront. Um, you know, we have many experts who've been working on coastal resiliency as well as, um, you know, a very complicated East Side coastal resiliency project and community action there trying to get a better plan. Um, so for those of you who are tuning in from around the world, you will get to see sort of an example of this model we have in New York that's really grassroots cultivated climate solutions. Um, on the Lower East Side of New York City that have been cultivated from the gardens to the neighborhood people, from rooftop beef farming and um, over to the waterfront on many waterfront resiliency um, initiatives. So this is really the community perspective um, on these issues. So um, I'll give it over to Hannah, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Felicia. And thank you everyone so much for coming to the planning meeting. Um, it's exciting to see everyone's faces again and see um, people we've collaborated with before um, and new faces as well, as we've said. Um, we have a lot of exciting presentations today. Um, Felicia's asked me to come on and moderate the meeting. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna try to keep us moving and make sure we um, stick to our schedule here so that way we get chance to hear everybody's amazing presentations. Um, at the end of the meeting, we're gonna do like a collective movement and collective visual collage. So I'll say that it's at the start of the meeting, if you wanna prepare and have a photo of nature on your phone, towards the end of the meeting, we like to do like, yeah, collaborative movement. So I'll play a song at the end of the meeting and we'll do some movement together and then hold up a picture of nature to our camera to create a digital collage at the end of the meeting. But um, before that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you have any technical issues during the call, please don't hesitate to message me privately and let me know if there's anything happening. Um, but first, we are going to hear from Wendy Brower, who's the founder of Green Map. And she's going to be giving us a presentation about the Lower East Side sustainability. So let's get Wendy here. Let me spotlight. Uh, there we go. Success. And everybody, if the screen is, um, you can adjust at the top where it says view options. So you can make it full screen or not have it fit how you like it. Um, I usually choose fit to window. So I'm Wendy Brower and um, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Next slide. I only have three minutes. And so you can see some scenes. I created a tour in 2020 and we're gonna follow that tour around. I can um, send you a link to this map afterwards. Next slide. We live in an incredible neighborhood. There's so much going on. And one of the places you could see the history is at the Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space on Avenue C. Um, they just actually produced the, by the way, my tour was about green infrastructure. And so I was highlighting some of the reasons we need it, which include the impacts of Hurricane Sandy. Next slide. Um, so we have incredible gardens in this neighborhood. And I see that Charles, Ross and Marga, other key gardeners are on this call. So I won't take long, but La Plaza Cultural is to me right in the epicenter of the Garden District, and that's a great place to see um, all kinds of regenerative practices in real life. And um, I included this slide of the hopeful bioswales, which are not going to be there in 2021. But one of these days, hopefully, we'll have additional stormwater collection systems built into the neighborhood. We're mostly paved except for these community gardens and our parks, and we're having increasing rainfall. So this is really important. Next slide. Um, I take part in the Avenue B uh, open street. So if you're not from New York, you might not have noticed that uh, many streets are, are closed to cars, or at least the cars have to only go five miles an hour 
to um, prioritize pedestrians and bicyclers. So I help move barriers once a week. And yeah, it sounds crazy, but I believe you got to be the change. So if you want to see somebody, if you want to see people experiencing something different, take part in making the demonstration project a reality. So I've been out there every Wednesday for a year now, and it's been amazing the scenes that are out there. Next slide. Several of them have become permanent, by the way. Um, I also work on street trees. So in 2019, I proposed a thousand street trees for our community. 500 of them have now been planted. And these are primarily native trees. So they are providing food for birds, butterflies, etc. I put up the link for the city's um, park, uh, the city's tree map. And there you can see the, uh, the value, the ecosystem value of these street trees is over a hundred million dollars a year. So each of us benefits from this very directly in cleaner air, less uh, pollution, less stormwater, and even the need for less air conditioning. Next slide, protect your local trees, get involved in stewardship. If you go into um, our parks, you might be surprised to realize that um, they too are green infrastructure. Um, and it's really important, especially when you consider this neighborhood has um, historic subterranean streams, also known as tidal creeks. There's evidence from people who live nearby that there's still water flowing in those creeks, even though the city acts like it doesn't exist. Um, you could see our flood zones are quite extensive and only a small part of the middle of lower Manhattan is considered outside a flood zone at this point. So for all of us, understanding green infrastructure, the role of nature in abating stormwater issues is absolutely critical. Next slide. Um, so um, you can see how high the water was at 8th Street and Avenue C. That's a pretty iconic image. The Girls Club at 8th and D has a roof uh, green roof, which uh, garden up there, which is actually another good way to absorb some of the stormwater. On the, a plan, the original plan for stormwater, and well, it's not the original, there's actually the Blue Way plan before it, but the Big U plan envisioned an extensive network of green roofs and street trees and bioswales. Very little of this has been built to date. And as we just experienced in Hurricane Ida, with three inches of rain coming down at once, we really need this work. So I'm a member of East River Park Action. Oops, it's not showing up very well here in this uh, thing, but I'm a part of East River Park Action. And I encourage everybody to get involved with the park planning right now, even if you haven't been before. Next slide. Um, and you can see, here, the extent of the stormwater during Hurricane Sandy that came into the neighborhood. And for many people, it was a, a huge wake up call. Um, I'm very much against the current East Side Coastal Resilience Project and happy to share if you don't already know that there's a temporary restraining order. They cannot start construction, which would include the removal of nearly a thousand mature trees. So this project is designed for storm surge and sea level rise, but not for the number one killer, which is in New York City, which is heat. I think it will actually contribute greatly to it. So I'm very glad the construction stopped and we can take a breather and hopefully come up with a better plan that is community engaged, like the original, some of the interim plans were. There have been so many plans. It's really hard, I think, for all coastal communities to consider in a comprehensive way all the issues that come with climate change. But we really need to do a good job in this community and not allow a model of what not to do to be imposed upon us. Next slide. Um, you know, you might worry a lot, especially about the most vulnerable people, which are many of whom live in NYCHA, New York Housing Authority, uh, social housing, right next to the river. But there are storm repairs and new resiliency uh, buildings are nearly completed. And you can see them online at, at bit.ly slash NYCHA FEMA 
or walk over there and see the kinds of protection that have been put in place that's, that's through this federally funded program. This is not true for the affordable um, co-ops in the neighborhood, which are not eligible for this federal funding. So we have lots to learn from other places around the world about how we can do better to have everybody be part of this. Next one, the next slide, please. Um, right on my corner, I'm just down the block from the Lillian Wald houses in January, um, I helped stop the, bull, uh, the, the cutting of trees there by in part by making a map that showed where the trees were marked. And so only three trees were moved. There's actually new little trees there. So all of us need to be vigilant is because I spoke up that I stopped the was able to stop other trees from being cut. And yes, it took a day's work and a couple, a couple of <laughs> difficult phone calls, but you know, all of us have some power for change. Next slide. Um, oh, I just wanna do a shout out to the, the, the free fridges. I think the current number is 144 in New York City. And these are direct. Anybody can put food in, anyone can take food out. If you don't yet have these in your community, it's a great way to promote mutual aid and also the reduction of waste. Make sure that people aren't starving right in your own community. Let's do what we can to keep people healthy. The bottom images are all from Governor's Island where Earth Matters um, created a soup kitchen farm last year and I got to pitch in every Tuesday. Next slide. Um, so there's lots of ways to get involved in the city and pitch in. We're so lucky that we have projects like the Earth Celebration that bring all these pieces together for a celebration. And we can all, uh, no matter what we do, whether we are a writer or a educator or um, it really doesn't matter. We all have ways we can pitch in and make community life more equitable, more um, green, and more fun. I think that's a really important part of all our work together. So I'm going to pass this on. Is there one more slide? Maybe? We'll stop. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll stop. And there's a lot of things to be upset about, including the fact that we no longer have the Lower East Side Ecology Center's compost yard um, in Sorry. East River Park. But um, Hopefully we'll have some um, good ways to work together to make sure they can come back very soon. Agree, but we'll have to go after Uncle Warren. Okay. Great, thank you thank so you. much, Wendy. Um, while we're between presenters here, I wanna ask if you are not presenting to please make sure that your mic is muted. So we avoid any background music while we have people presenting um, noise and such. Anyway, thank you so much, Wendy. That was a great presentation. Um, our, the next presentation that we'll hear from is Charles Kruzel. Um, He's the director of the Los Saida United Neighborhood Gardens. Um, and he's gonna be giving a presentation on the community gardens and their climate solutions. So let's give it up for Charles. Thank you. We started Lungs, which is Lower East Side of the United Neighborhood Gardens, in uh, 2011 because felt that we need to have the gardens work together to preserve themselves. We have a lot of issues within the city and a lot of pressure to develop green open spaces here. And we thought that the way to do to protect that was to work together. Um, so there are 53 gardens in this neighborhood. The reason there's so many gardens is because in the 60s and 70s, the city basically abandoned this neighborhood and let it let buildings burn down. And so people went to these vacant lots, cleaned them up and turned them into community gardens. We used to have 60 or 70, but now they're then we have 53 right now, which are seven and a quarter acres in total, which is not a lot, but in New York City it's a lot. We had the largest uh, concentration or density of community gardens, I think, in the country. Uh, the 53 gardens represent prop approximately 10,000 people who are actively or passively members of the gardens. And we've tried to make ourselves uh, well known politically, basically, so we can protect ourselves. And we've achieved uh, success in that in some ways. 
and um, have not achieved success. <laughs> We're all volunteers and it's very difficult to sustain ourselves in the last couple of years with Sandy or uh, COVID. It's been very, very difficult to get people to come out and work together because they're afraid. Uh, being outside is a huge benefit. Uh, having the open space that allows the public to, to uh, come into the gardens has been really beneficial. But only in the last six months or something, people are able to realize that. Um, so our issues really are to continue to build uh, public support for the gardens and to show that they're so necessary for the health and well-being in this neighborhood. Um, we have, in the last year, it's been very, very difficult to get people to come out and um, get people to cooperate at all. I think we, we sort of broke down as a society and how to deal with one another. And that's affected the gardens as well as everything else. So um, I'm hoping that we can continue to do this. But at the same time, we run into many, many issues. Wendy talked about bias whales, and we've been working for five years trying to get bias whales built and have run into nothing but obstacles from government agencies. So between the government agencies, the bureaucrats, and uh, developers running these spaces, it becomes very much an issue of uh, <coughs> actively courting the politicians and actively trying to find support. Um, we continue to do that and we'll, we will continue to do that, but that's really what we need to do is uh, really make ourselves well-known politically uh, to, to be able to sustain the gardens and to be able to sustain the green spaces, which is so important. So I will end there. Uh, thank you very much. But Thank I also you. have to check out for the day. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, that was great. Okay, our next moving right along. Um, our next presenter here is Ross Martin. Um, he's a gardener at La Plaza Cultural Garden. I'm um, and he'll be talking about um, the gardens and their climate solutions. I'll spotlight that and get that going. All right, um, again, my name is Ross Martin um, and I'm with Marga Snyder here. She, she and I joined the garden about um, 20 some, 25, 26 years ago. Um, and can you go to the next image, please? Uh, this is what the garden was when it started. This is Plaza Cultural Armando Perez before it was Armando Perez. The willow trees aren't there yet, but they're building the geodesic domes. That's in like 1977. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is what we came to about uh, in 1997, so I'm like, um, 20 years later, the garden was in total disuse and they were they just finished fighting a legal battle that lasted about two, um, four or five years and they won, but the garden was in disarray. Next slide, please. So when Margaret and I got involved, we helped establish a lawn area. And actually the little pink strip that you see there is part of Felicia Young's um, you, uh, demonstration or, or celebrations <laughs> Gaia's fallopian tube I think giving birth to Gaia um, next slide please but we had a dream we, El Sueño the dream we wanted to create you know bring it back to a, a lush state and make it more useful and bring back the community use that the founders started with it but we again ran into other legal issues. Giuliani tried to develop most of the gardens. Ours in particular was under the chopping block. So we started again another like six to eight year battle with development. Next slide, please. <laughs> so uh, basically this slide kind of shows you what, what exists now after several years of doing um, rest, restoration work, not exactly now because the big willow tree on the right is not there anymore, 
we'll get into that. Next slide, please. When we were done um, with the legal battle, Marga's son, Zach, who's on the right, and that's Marga on the left, um, she noticed that their classes in the school no longer had science. So um, she wanted to start something in the gardens. We started what we called the Ecology Club in La Plaza. This is the of that. Next, please. And then the next slide shows Willow Bill doing a workshop in the garden. He came and built willow benches, willow reindeer. You can see one of his willow benches to the left of him um, in honor of, well, in memory of 9-11. Um, so this is like about, I think, 2000 or 2002. And next slide, please. And then the next slide is going to show Sorry, this is gonna be more than three minutes. Um, <laughs> this is the Ecology Club, um, all of the students from that club. Zach is now, what, 26? Mm -hmm. um, next slide, please. And what this led to is Margo wanted to really get the garden more on level with sustainability. So she got me involved in becoming, um, in taking permaculture courses so we could try and come up with a plan for the garden. Next, please. And so we did come up with an analysis of like the neighborhood and um, the, <clears throat> where the garden lies and the things that Wendy talked about and Charles talked about a little bit, but that it, we actually sit right on top of one of those buried streams. And we noticed it because the, we noticed that the trees are, you know, are huge for their, were huge for their age. And also that, um, the reason there aren't buildings there is often because they either collapse or burn down. This is basically the analysis for the site. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then the next slide will show you the, the three phase pro, um, permaculture project that we envisioned, mainly with um, storm water <laughs> management, but also with uh, redesigning the space. But then Irene and Sandy hit. This is after Irene, one of the huge willows fell, another linden fell, and keep going. Let's just kind of move through these next slides. Um, so in addition to the willow falling, we were under four feet of water during Sandy. And this next slide will show you that, um, which basically that's Avenue C and, and 9th Street, La Plaza is in the upper corner, another iconic image of Sandy. But what we noticed is that anything that was a little bit higher in the garden survived um, the saltwater influx, but anything lower, a lot of things lower did not. Keep going for the next slide, please. But what it did is it opened up the garden so that we could start realizing our permaculture plan, including a nature trail, which you're seeing here, and a fruit and nut orchard, which goes through. Keep going through these slides, please. And um, so this basically shows the construction of that trail. So it's an educational service, but and then also we were we got involved with the Occupy movement and food justice. We started to raise awareness of food production and the possibility of doing that in the gardens. Keep going. Um, got another one of that. And then keep going, please. And this, we started a, started doing sort of craft projects and raising more produce, thinking of ways to um, raise revenue to support the gardens long-term because it was, uh, Charles pointed out, we're at the whim of the political winds which change constantly. Next slide, please. And the Parks Department isn't particularly supportive in terms of raising revenue. We also do private events, like this is Outstanding in the Field, a big dinner that they had. This is before the Willows and the Lindens fell, but they came again this year. We got like over 100 people that spend like up to two to $300 a plate to come to those dinners. And we dug our own bioswale. Um, we weren't gonna wait for Gardens Rising. Um, to capture the rainwater from our site. All of this, you know, was really inspiring. So we decided to, we wanted to build an indoor outdoor, um, next slide please, uh, uh, workshop. This just shows Rolando Paletti's artwork on the fence using recycled materials, obviously. Next please. 
And um, so we uh, designed a solar pavilion. Um, this is just showing some images of produce and uh, mushrooms that we foraged from one of the willow trees before it rotted. Um, and next. Um, Ross? No, yes. we're just running behind time. Yeah, I'm gonna cut in here real quick. Thank you, Felicia. Sure. If you wouldn't mind wrapping up, I really appreciate your presentation. Sure, this is the solar pavilion, basically the end of it. Um, we are in, we've built it. So um, maybe just go to uh, uh, like three or four slides away from here, if it's quick enough. But this is just showing you it actually being constructed. So right now we're in the phase of raising money to get the rest of the solar panels for it and the green roof. This is an, just diagram of that. And um, we're also digitizing the rest of the garden um, and we're trying to step up our game with our compost system to really kind of heighten the regenerative nature of the soils, uh, maximizing the beneficial relationship of the microbiology there. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, Lovely. Thank you so much, Ross and Marga. It's exciting stuff. Um, all right, we're going to move ahead to our next presenter here. Um, that's going to be Jessica Hall. Um, she's a member of East River Park Action and is going to be presenting an update on the waterfront as well as the, um, the, the Coastal Resiliency Project. So one second here, let's unpin this. OK. So let's find Jessica here. If you want to go ahead and unmute, there you go. Yeah, hi. Well, it's really exciting to be here tonight. I'm just so impressed and pleased. I've lived in this neighborhood in the Lower East Side since 1986. My children were born on Avenue A. I've had so many birthday parties for them like every year and six and B I had my 50th birthday party in La Plaza and I didn't know a lot of these things but I see a lot of familiar faces tonight and um, I'm new to the party as far as East River Park action is concerned and I'm really appreciative that Wendy um, spoke to many of the details involved because my presentation is not my presentation is more macro so here's some pictures I took of people um, who want to save the park. What I found when I was doing outreach was that people who are in the park using the park, a lot of people still really don't know what's going on. So this uh, kind of speaks to what, what Wendy was talking about, you know, and all of everyone's talking about community inclusion in, in planning around the environment that we live in um, and how important that is. And Wendy mentioned that the community had come up with a plan with the city and the city just ditched it out of nowhere, basically with no notice and presented this other plan that is incredibly destructive. Um, so here are some people that, <laughs> you know, here's our community. This is where we experience community is in these open spaces. Um, you can advance it. So just to read the mission again, this is very simple. I'm gonna, uh, Wendy put the, uh, website to East River Park Action in the chat. So if there's a lot of history there and a lot of people have been working really, really hard every single day to cover every aspect that they need to protect this park. That um, So the mission is to, to stop the destruction of the park. <laughs> East River Park Action seeks environmental justice for our park and the community it serves and Again, this points to, uh, this is social justice, ecological justice, racial justice, economic justice. These things are all intertwined. Um, so we demand a truly resilient and comprehensive plan that provides flood control against the worst effects of climate crisis. Um, we have been accused of prior prioritizing trees over people, which is kind of a typical false dichotomy that the gardens, I think, and parks have been presented with historically pitting housing against parks. Um, and that's, that's a false dichotomy. Um, so we can, we can move ahead. Yeah, go trees. Yay. And here's how, look how green our park is. And here's a lovely lady that I encountered who, um, I don't know who she is, but she is wanting to protect the trees and also protect her health. Um, and 
So I don't know what to say about, I think we all understand and agree that we need trees. So, <laughs> but it's not just the trees, um, these bushes, so many birds and bees, it's a, it's a whole ecosystem that they basically want to dump uh, tons of millions of tons of un fill of unknown origins into and layer it with concrete and astroturf. So that's not very nice. So we can advance this. So, and here's a, here's a visual to get an idea about how large this is. Again, Wendy, thank you for presenting the picture of the big U, which shows, I think it's interesting to look at the difference in the, in the imagery between Wendy's photo of this same area that was much more integrated going into the city and greener. And this is like this very kind of startling picture of this, this like red, these orange zones that are going to be um, destroyed. So that means everything, everything will, will be lost. Um, and I encountered someone in the park today when I would go in the park in the morning with my dog and I just chalk, save this park, eastriverparkaction.org. And a lot of people going by will say to me, it's a done deal, it's over. And you know, that's just not helpful. So we all know that. <laughs> as long as there's a tree to stand for, we can stand for the trees. So we can advance it. Okay, it's pretty simple visual. Here's the difference, right? This is what they already started to do on the left side with the picnic table on the AstroTurf on top of concrete. That looks very inviting, doesn't it? <laughs> this, is, this is what um, our representatives are crowing about making such a great, uh, great improvements and, and great strides. And here's my dog Scout with a little friend. My dog is a big dog on grass and clover. I mean, come on, it's just like so simple. Okay, we can advance it. So what are our goals? Um, we want a flood control plan that is constructed in an environmentally forward thinking manner, right? So pe what people have been saying is that what we have now is already doing a job of, of absorbing and working like a sponge and actually the current plan that the city wants to execute um, seems to protect the FDR drive more than anything. So we do support interim flood protection. This is something else that has been misconstrued that we don't want flood protection, that we don't care about the public housing that Wendy mentioned, which all of us care about very passionately. And we would like to see the uh, park expanded. Um, and we believe that there and know that there are better solutions. And I would also just like to mention that um, I think we all know that there's a huge mental health component to having these spaces that we can go into again and congregate and be healthy and be active and breathe fresher air. And all of this really should go without saying, but apparently it, it can't and it doesn't. I can really see in the presentation of La Plaza just how involved it is in to create spaces that are, are resilient. And that's a great example of what we could do on a larger scale. So thank you very much for that. I don't know what slide is next, if there's another one. Maybe I'm done. Oh, right. Wendy mentioned the temporary restraining order. So again, the, um, the, these folks that have been involved with these efforts, like Wendy, much longer than myself, had a lawyer in place, raised money for legal fees. And so as soon as the day came that um, the city came in to, to, to start destroying the park and removing bushes, they went right to court and got this temporary restraining order and it's been extended. Maybe Wendy knows that status of it today. I don't actually, I didn't get caught up when I came home from work. Um, all is to say, and I know that everybody here knows this, that we can't give up. That's not how we make progress <laughs> by saying it's a done deal and we can't do anything, even though every single one of our elected officials, some of whom I really cared for, have completely betrayed the community on this. Um, but we're going to keep fighting and we really, really hope you will join us. So go on the website. There's so much information there. Um, people have worked so hard to make sure that everything's there, that you could get the whole story. And, and I want to mention too, that there's lots of opportunities for artists to get involved with these efforts. There's all kinds of actions. There's many different ways to get engaged. And I'm gonna keep referring to Wendy because everything you said was so great. Um, that there's something you can do on every level. You can make a phone call, you can write a letter, you can, you can show up, you can chalk, I just go and chalk, et cetera, et cetera. So please check it out, get involved and pass it on.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Jessica. <laughs> um, moving right along here um, to our next presenter, we're gonna hear from Dr. Paul Mankiewicz, who's gonna talk about um, the climate and the coastal resiliency. So let me go ahead and pull up Paul's video here. Wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Yes, we can. Um, so uh, just as Wendy described, trees do some work. So the peak load, which you've suffered from on the Lower East Side, I did myself when I lived down there, 11.6 million megawatts is basically what makes for bad days for Con Edison and what drops, what continues to increase our energy costs. But if you take a look, Manhattan, when the Lower East Side was covered with salt marshes and the rest of the 300 square miles was covered with trees, meadows, and marsh, the daily electric equivalent in cooling was 130 million megawatts. So it's not just a tree that does good. They literally reverse urban heat island and in a way locally reverse climate change by capturing carbon. About every three tons of every 300 tons of water is about a ton of carbon but basically just as you're saying build swales i think about the first 30 in the city with parks and dep those swales capture water and move it into trees the next slide shows something uh, so basically we've had flooding well that's actually a pretty straightforward thing to deal with so this was the old sim size on sim side on the box river and it was basically a metal handling place for decades. I just fill over tidal marsh. And the next slide shows basically the design, which is it's a work area. So this is a material handling site and 6.2 acres. And the yellow shows a path of water flowing and the kind of yellow bars underneath it uh, are shown in the next slide. So let, me, no, let me turn that other slide for a second. It's, it's just what you, two million gallons of water is what came off of this site in hurricanes, Irene, and basically it's about a foot of water over the whole thing. The next slide shows you where to put it. And we could do this throughout the city. Actually, I was gonna get, I built a little one of these under El Hardin uh, 20 years ago, but this is a big one. And so better to just use recycled glass aggregate so you and I, we all make it by basically drinking wine and breaking the bottles. And that has, this particular piece has got a 50% void space. In other words, East River Park could be an aquifer supporting lawns, trees, meadows and all with an immense, basically something like 2 million gallons per six acres uh, of water holding capacity, basically flood prevention. And he could do it at the cost of literally supporting vegetation. So, and I built this aquifer to literally uh, support the next slide's um, contribution to local ecology, which is basically, this is a wetland at the edge of, El Hard, of, a, of a, the Sim site. And all that water runs into the ground. You can see the photovoltaic there pumping water out of the ground into the wetland, into the plant. So we can very quickly build out of something like glass aggregate aquifers and make even pop-up planters that we could bring out in May and basically uh, have them run through the whole year. That's very quick. And then as uh, everyone described, Ross and the rest, basically uh, being able to uh, capture the water in the swales makes a huge difference. But let's also try to pour the water into our parks. I had designed several swales around El Hardin and they didn't build them, but we should because the flooding problem is not gonna go away. And we can catch it exactly in these exquisite green spaces. The next slide shows, this is what the cost is basically. So all the water from through that recycled plastic and glass and the rest flows across that six acre concrete pad and into this essentially native plant meadow. And it's designed so that the water infiltrates through a highly porous soil and into the ground. So this is, was deep enough where I could catch that 2 million gallons of water and maybe it'd be half that in East River Park, but even so, it's an immense amount of water and the water is literally the force which captures carbon 
and trans and changes the climate of the city, drops the temperature of the city, basically decreases, as Wendy pointed out, uh, heat is a, is a health issue. Basically, some hundreds of people die in these very, very hot days. You're looking literally at a line of protection against thermal load. The next slide shows, so sedums are wonderful little plants. Uh, being a plant biologist, I can't say something against them, but they're basically at too small a scale to regulate temperature because you need multi layers where the top leaves actually boil off the hot air and the bottom leaves drop below ambient. And if you can read that instrument in the middle there, it's reading on a 95 degree day, 82 degrees in the shade beneath that native meadow on a green roof um, filled, filled with this lightweight soil I make uh, on the fiber off facility, which you also get to see. It's basically this great thing, parks built, all the different green roofs, nothing wrong with sedum. But it's exactly these native plants which support the pollinators that have been here for the last 18,000 years, basically as long as the glaciers have been off the landscape. And those support uh, some several hundred species of native bees amongst all kinds of other flora and fauna. Next slide. So <clears throat> I have built floating wetlands. Basically, I have a lightweight soil that floats and you can literally with a something as simple as a, a forklift, drop Jersey barriers, put a swimming pool liner in the middle and capture water that runs off elevated roadways or anywhere. And it's very cheap to do because you don't have to do any earth moving. So the idea is to take this no man's land underneath the, the under, well, any place underneath the 700 miles of elevated roadway we have, but literally to make it back into the wetland ecology that probably covered something like 60 square miles of the city before we got here. And this relatively inexpensive, there's no other way to treat that water because it's just gonna go into the combined sewer. And one could literally with that water create the same biodiversity that lives in our wetlands systems across. And the cooling capacity of this kind of area is under the bridge, so it's in the shade. What that means is those walls and that wetland will be, they'll approach the dew point. Extreme case, 95 degree day, 50% relative humidity, the dew point is 80 degrees. So half that, that the higher humidities, of course. But the point is that basically this is wasted space, but we could literally get places where, I love the, I think it was Ross showing that children can learn with this ecology. Well, that's exactly right. You know, where does Darwin come from? from having his hands and from uh, young girls having their hands in the soil itself. And the Amish have showed us that that actually suppresses allergies, suppresses immune diseases, basically makes health better. Next slide. So just to show there's only one measure of what we're doing and East River Park should stand up to this metric too, carbon capture. So something like these floating wetlands could capture one to three kilograms of carbon per square meter. Walls, maybe a kilogram, which is still not nothing. It's way more than a lawn. Green roofs I built go one to two kilograms per square meter. Uh, and something like the coastal marshes, which ought to be built uh, everywhere, it's something up to four kilograms per square meter. And basically that is the base of the food web. It turns all the pollutants from wastewater, which is well treated in a lot of ways. It turns it into the fishery, which is far better. Next slide. So even my, my colleague Igor showed how those, that little cove there could be enlarged by a great deal. But the point is that every mile of that poured concrete costs about three and a half tons of CO2. So if you're gonna pay the price for the concrete then actually do something to capture it, there's only one measure of what we do. We will, our, <clears throat> the next generation will evaluate us on how much carbon, the landscapes we tended captured. And that could be a great deal, this being one of the richest tempered estuaries on planet Earth. So uh, as was described here, the, the park is just a anathema, basically a throwback, but it could be different. And the waste stream, the waste stream, 2,500 tons a day of waste glass, something like 19,500 tons per day of waste concrete brick and and brick and basically one could therefore build an aquifer that could create wetlands and meadows and playing fields that were real grass that actually cooled the landscape and did some work and were 
enjoyable to play on with the microbiome that we need to live the next uh, uh, decade. Uh, next slide. So that's a simple story here. This is uh, uh, basically on a, whatever it is, 80, uh, 92 degree day. As you start getting more and more green coverage on roofs, on street sides, on walls, you basically drop the body temperature. And on a day like that, Central Park with water, you got to have water, runs at about 80 degrees. So that's the point. The, the trees are a great idea, but really tomorrow, as soon as we possibly can on the Lower East Side and elsewhere, you need to cover roofs, walls, and street sides with plantings because they literally work to turn storm water or gray water into literally capture of carbon and the biota that <coughs> gives joy to our lives here in this great city. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you, Paul. Great. Thank yeah. you so much, Paul. Um, it's wonderfully and wonderful and detailed. Love learning things. Thank you so much. Um, let's move on to our next presenter here. Um, can be a little switch in our schedule here. We're actually going to hear from Michelle Brody. Um, as we said at the start of the call here, Michelle um, is one of the artists who has been doing the costumes for Earth Celebrations for a long time. So I'll let her take it away here, Michelle. Let me spotlight you and then it's your time to shine. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I've been with Earth Celebrations since 2009. You can go to the next slide. Uh, it started off with doing these um, grass skirts, which we had on view at World Financial Center. Um, the grass skirts, of course, have been replanted every year since then um, and going through various refurbishments, but it's a, been a wonderful project to be seeing going for so long. Next slide. Um, when we were at the Hudson River pageant, when we moved to the west side of the city, we focused a lot on native species. So here are some earlier costumes, uh, oyster and diamondback terrapin. I just yesterday saw someone walking a turtle in my neighborhood, a tortoise that looked a lot like the terrapin's back. Uh, next slide, I use a lot of natural materials or material, a lot of fabrics from materials for the arts try to be as renewable as possible. These costumes, the renewable energy spirits have also been in the pageant uh, since 2009. Uh, keep going. Um, they're more like ethereal creatures walking past uh, with our energy. Uh, the second year that we did, 2010, um, the Hudson River eel she, uh, and the blue crab keep making appearances as well. It's good to see these costumes still going. Um, the eel, especially the blue crab, especially uses indigo and natural dyes on silk. Uh, next slide. Um, I know that Sewell is going to be doing a lot of natural dyeing as well, and I'm glad that that's going to continue. Um, I do a lot of drawings for each of, you know, as an artist, we all do drawings for our, our projects, and I'm always excited to see how the wonderful volunteers that work been working with me on Wednesday, especially Rosa and um, Pedro, over the years have been great. Uh, assistance in making these uh, these costumes actually happen from my drawings to reality. So all of the painting on the climate change consequences costume were painted by Rosa. Uh, thank you, Rosa. And uh, next slide. Um, the Gaia spirit also uh, hand painted silk. Uh, she's actually a large water filter as her dress. Uh, next slide. And so all of these for when we move to the east side, these, so these are all from, um, uh, yeah, what year? 2019, 2019 um, and, or 18. And this is the alternative energy spirit. She's a, a walking windmill and solar panel. Next one. Again, all materials from materials for the art. So during COVID, so that was 2019. 2020, uh, I ended up working at home and uh, doing the workshops while uh, Rosa and, um, and Pedro worked as well on another costume in their home. But I was working on um, 
uh, sustainable materials and create a costume entirely out of paper from a recycled linen tablecloth. Next slide. So all the paper was um, recycled uh, in a process that I do in my paper making. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this was the wonderful uh, costume uh, for the sustainable development go goals that Wendy Brower gave an incredible uh, demonstration on uh, before COVID as a group. And um, these are listing all of the sustainable development goals um, and the uh, headdress was also finished by another volunteer um, and it was great to see this costume come together, even though I physically really only worked on it one day to show people how to do um, draw uh, writing with resist on silk painting. Next slide. So uh, carbon sequestration, um, just the whole notion of what we just heard about and how uh, carbon can get sequestered down into the roots and into the ground and pull through through the plants that are sucking up all that wonderful sun through chlorophyll and uh, breathing in the, the carbon that we, uh, give, we breathe out. And so this costume is a little bit more um, abstract. Uh, she's basically a, war, a walking carbon collector uh, and it's all found materials and the headdress is actually uh, seaweed that uh, Felicia researched and she's raffia and she's wonderful. And she's uh, worn uh, by the woman who helped me do, uh, build it, Joanne Fink. Uh, next slide. So heading into 2021, we are unfortunately, we're limited in our number of volunteers that could work with us. But once again, Rosa and Pedro came out and painted all the incredible leaves for, our, for the new um, soil. Uh, carbon sequestration um, spirit, and she was a walking band, a walking fan of leaves that were collecting all that and going down to her roots. And her dress was all uh, made with natural dyes and hand and tan dyed silk and indigo. Next slide. And um, also was doing a hand painted silk of the uh, flood map which of course we've seen other versions of during this presentation. Um, for that uh, costume, she also, we also made a fountain uh, with water so-called running at the top, which was actually lit. Uh, next slide. And here's my last slide. This is actually the back of Rosa and Pedro together in the most recent pageant. So you see that wonderful fan of painted leaves that they work so, so, so hard in producing. Thank you, thank you again. And uh, see you in May of 2022, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> Lovely, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I'll do a quick gallery view here. And then um, we have a little less a little over 30 minutes here and I have a number of people to get through. So um, everyone let's be super mindful of time moving forward. Um, our next presentation is from Didi. Um, Didi um, is of the Masters of Succession Collective and is gonna be pre presenting um, some of her art in the bioremediation sculpture. So let's get Didi's presentation up. Um, you go, Dee. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm trying to find you. Trying to find me. I'm here. Oh, you, are you just, you're only doing audio? No, I have. Um, you're sharing I your just, screen. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. I right see. now you okay. just see. You don't see anything interesting yet. Yay. Okay. I'm in edit mode. So this is really interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm Dee Dee Malker. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I love that there's so many people here from around different places and checking in to see what we're doing locally. Um, so every year since um, Felicia invited me uh, to do a sculpture for the river, I've done a bioremediating sculpture um, that also cleans water, air, and soil as a byproduct of it being a sculpture that floats on the water. And I didn't know I could make a floating sculpture, but I guess I, 
I learned. <laughs> um, so a lot of the work that I do um, is interested in um, the lifestyle in which I live that um, is created over many years. Everyone, as we live our lives, we make connections and those connections I've been making for the past 10 years at least have been to do with um, bioremediation and symbiosis, working together and um, taking care of the land and permaculture principles that we've been working on when I studied actually with Mar Marga and Ross many years ago. And so I do this, I invite people together to um, put their, to do what they want to do in the place they want to see and with a few uh, special people and they make connections and those connections make bigger connections and then we can create a village. And this is sort of the idea of that. And that's um, the idea of the, how we're interconnected and how to use that and as which I use this, these ideas in the sculpture. So my lifestyle is creating this sculpture and that is interconnected and cannot be break, broken between everything that's around me in my lifestyle. And here's, so we start from microbes and go out to the metropolis. And this is um, an example of the many, many microbes and the microbiome that we have around us that um, plays a part in why the sculpture is um, starting with the microbes. Like there are mud balls in there that uh, mud that we ferment and create uh, beneficial micro organisms that clean water and do the process in the water as they do the process in the soil or they do the process in our stomachs. And that's um, the bottom of the food web actually. So we're starting from a very small part and comparing um, that to our body and comparing our nervous system to the mycelial network. These are just ways to look at them, the micro and the, the macro. And here's a crack in a sidewalk that flows water and here's a river and the way the water goes through the playground is much the same way the water might, you know, over the years go through a landscape. And I find that really interesting. And so when I walk the, the playground, I can really feel the ecosystem that created this crack. I encourage people to walk on cracks. Um, that was fun. And uh, this is um, the land of the Lenape image in 1613. And now we have this built city and it's a diversity that's changed. And this is um, information from the Wilikia project. And I'm gonna skip right to the Masters of Succession. We use bioremediating sculptures for this project and then the materials. And then I'm gonna go over the, the piazza, which is coming to everything coming together. So the, uh, the sculpture I did in 18 was this one was an elder. I did with this with Marta Dan and we built an uh, design this elder and through our lifestyle and connecting um, our resources, we were able to create this uh, sculpture. As well as this one, the, fine, the next year was um, what became um, the youth culture, I felt. And this, I didn't know what I was gonna be doing until I actually did it. So what happened was this, this the material I found created this image. And I see it as the youth um, taking over from the elders or the elders passing on to the youth. And the next image, and this is it floating, floating away. Um, the next uh, was uh, COVID and I did a little mini sculpture with what I had left lying around. And I had all the materials from the years before kind of accumulated in my apartment and I was able to do a very mini sculpture. And so this year we did the turtle and the frog. And that also came out of the materials I had available. I started with the, tur um, the turtle and that was, um, a uh, great uh, floating giant loggerhead turtle down the river. And then I came across this coquille idea to put the little coquille, the tiny tree frog on top of the back. And these are both uh, indicator species that are seeking refuge in our biosphere. So they floated away, but they actually went in upside down and all of the materials on top of it fell into the water and they started work right away because they, oops, they like to swim. And so here's the other image from this year. And the idea that we're taking a lot of these, um, these sculptures and we're putting them together, if we all did this together, like I'm just one person, um, if we all did this together, we would really be making a difference to the ecosystem because this sculpture actually cleans the water, air and soil. And I'll explain what materials I used um, for that. And we, I used, here's a list. Um, we're not gonna go through it too closely, but um, basically there's Phragmites, which pulls carbon out of the 
water column and we have, I tied it together with milkweed twine, which we made from milkweed. And there's mussels, there's bladderic kelp, which deacidifies and sequesters carbon. There's using the ferry and the public transportation, which I love. I hope we never get rid of the ferries. Um, here is the Phragmites, and this is actually willow that we're, they're weaving, willow trees. The willow trees in our neighborhood have been falling, unfortunately, like La Plaza Cultural lost several willow trees. So there was lots of willow sitting around. Um, and I'm doing the mushrooms. I'm growing mushrooms at home. So I have these mushrooms. These are oyster mushrooms, which are bioremediating for petroleum and other, other um, chemicals. We're using these mushrooms after the hair boom, which is from dog hair. Uh, they, um, they eat the oil and they transform the oil out of the hair boom. This is a Paul Stamets idea. And I use these hair booms to, um, as ballast on the sculpture. And they also, the sculpture also, this is the dog hair and the human hair, uh, which Tessa helped with. And these are where the oysters hung as they waited for us and the mussels. And my friend Lisa jumped in and helped me and Alexa is there. And they're the new gardener's help. And we just all get it done somehow. And here's the seeds. We use medicinal seeds, the local seeds in the area. What, what birds would fly over this sculpture that might want some food and leftover flowers from ceremonies. And we have seed balls, mud balls, mycospheres, moss, mollusk, and mini spheres. So here are the, the mud balls that clean the water and the seed balls and uh, the mud. And the, this is, we, we make these mud balls in workshops. So I just have them lying around and we have flatterack kelp in the local area. And the more of this on the sculpture, the better. And we make our own paints and out of clay and microbes. And then at the end of the day, we take all of us as human beings and we come together to do what we wanna do in the place we wanna see. And as long as everything we do cleans water, air, and soil, um, we have cascades of serendipity and we go back to the microbes and thank them. And then we come together and care for each other and the earth. And we equal a family of love at the piazza. And we love piazzas. And that's the end of my, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, together huh amazing yes. how it all comes together right yeah. it's sort of like the full story of why this sculpture is important to me and i hope it is for everyone else lovely thank you so much Dee. i know we're all excited to see you here um moving right along to our next yep. presentation Thanks. here um so next we'll hear from kathy Kutzberg who's um, a Lower East Side artist um, and has helped in previous years with our, our zero waste costumes. So let me go ahead and get you up there, Kathy, so you can show the work that you've been doing. Hi, everybody. Um, I just started uh, working on the zero waste costume I think it was during the pandemic because I live so close to the community center, I was able to go over there and uh, do some work uh, when nobody was able to do anything but freeze. And <laughs> so that's kind of how I got involved in um, creating zero waste costume. Um, I'm hoping to expand this even a little bit more because uh, the first year, it was pretty experimental. I had never um, grown anything before, and um, especially for an art project. And um, so it had various degrees of success. And uh, this year, I was actually able for the first time to um, grow all of the materials that I was trying to grow, including, um, I, uh, well, I'll go, I'll take one step back. When I was working um, in, two, in 2020 during the pandemic, um, I, or maybe 
I um, was working from home and so I couldn't really go very far and that's when I started creating the the bonnet that you see here um, I used um, Virginia creeper vines that I had in my in my backyard I have a backyard here and I was able to sort of twist and weave them together into this um, I'll call it a bonnet um, the other part that you see in this costume here is um, mycelium. Uh, sub, it's a mycelium with hemp substrate um, that is part of the hat. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and this, uh, this is the mycelium um, right here. Uh, I grew mycelium um, this year again it was covid so i was growing it at home uh, i grew it in a bunt cake pan i grew it in cups um, i had a better success this time because i was really careful about mold and growing everything with a sterile um, environment uh, I have a picture there on the left of the materials that you need uh, to really uh, grow this uh, sculptural material. Um, and then you watch this video on YouTube. It takes two minutes uh, and then you just follow the instructions and it does take about a week and a half to grow um, the mycelium um, and hemp together and then you can see the forms that you you can get out of it um, on the right and actually it's funny i had these posted on facebook these these pictures of the the uh and, and somebody actually wanted me to actually ask me to do it when i was working this summer um, they were excited about the idea of 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 creating um um you know uh a natural material, a natural zero waste material. Okay, you can go to the next one. And um, and here I made um, a staff there. Um, I also started branching out a little bit into making these um, these uh, different um, accessories like um, I have at, on the left I have these little tiny um, these were grown in an egg carton these little mycelium shapes and then there's a glass bead on the end and I used uh, I had some used um, like a, a choker and I took um, some other uh, socks that I had here and I, I stitched the mycelium right onto some other fabrics and then created a costume and um, the costume I used, uh, the costume I wore, I also was dancing. I was taking a dance class uh, because I'm stuck at home all the time. Um, so I learned how to belly dance on Zoom. And so I, I went ahead and made a belly dancing um, costume. So, okay, you can go to the next one. And then um, this was last year. Uh, last year I had a better success with um, creating this kelp vest or bodice and um, the the one thing i have to say about the about the kelp is that it's a little bit crunchy once it gets dry so i think i need a little more work with this particular material um, and there on the bottom right i was um, doing one of my first zoom um, workshops where I was wetting down the kelp and then putting it over a mannequin body. And then I am wearing it, of course, on the on the um, top slide. Okay, next. Uh, this was the one thing, okay, the uh, kombucha leather. Um, I actually got the kombucha leather to grow. It just took like about six weeks to get it really going because it prefers a warmer environment. Um, I grew it in the basement of the Sixth Street Community Center. Um, and it seemed to do better as the temperature warmed up. But the first step was to um, get the um, get the 
to get it i i've never been successful at fermenting anything so i was really excited when it actually started working um i watched it for weeks just sitting there doing nothing and then finally if you can see in number two um that was the uh the mat the the kombucha leather the mat that grew right into the um containers and then um, once it was thick enough, I could pull it out of the bottom and put it right on a piece of wood, let it dry. And then um, the bottom there, um, I number three is what the leather looks like. And I still have little pieces of it. I have been experimenting with it. It's um, a little bit temp or it's sensitive to humidity and moisture. So, um, I was able to make a purse out of it, but um, I think I will need a little more practice with this particular material. Okay, next. Um, there, that was supposed to be a video on, on the left, but on the right, I am attempting to um, a, a, some kind of belly dancing form here, which is not natural to me. I'm not naturally a dancer performer. I'm a sculptor, but I did, I'm wearing there the kombucha leather, um, the bag, if you can see around my waist is the kombucha leather bag. Um, I did make a belly dancing skirt out of um, bamboo and um, spoons that were found in, um, um, in uh, the comp East Village comp composting center. The, People throw spoons away by accident when they compost. And so there's tons of spoons. I flattened them out and created um, like musical instruments with the metal um, and they clank around with the bamboo. Um, but that is my costume. I'm wearing the kelp vest and the kombucha bag there. Um, I don't have the hat on, but, and also of course, Michelle Brody's um, skirt, I put around my waist or around my neck so that I um, could, so the sound from my skirt would um, sort of. Kathy, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was just going to say thank you, Felicia. This is great, Kathy. Thank you so much. I have to move on to the next presentation um, for the sake of time. Thank you for showing us. And it's exciting working with the bio arts materials. And I know we're all excited to see what we can do with them this year. Um, next, we'll hear from Lucrecia Novoa who's one of our artists um, and runs the puppet workshop. So she's gonna talk about what some of the past puppet designs have been. So, all right, Lucrecia. Hey, hi everybody. Um, waiting for, yes. Um, I'm working with the organization since 2002 as a volunteer and became, I believe, uh, director of the Puppet Workshop in um, 2004. So I organized, I know there are not much time, but I, I organized uh, this um, uh, display, um, trying to show you how uh, the workshop is, how um, became a workshop. So what is the first step? of this creative uh, creative process of uh, puppet making. So next slide. Okay, uh, first of all, the first thing I have to hear from Felicia about the concept of the year. I'm going to show the designs from to the 2020. And we had three different concepts to work with and our responsibility is make uh, a face puppet plus a dress, adding all the concept. So you can see the first one is climate draw drawdown solution. I didn't have any idea what was that. So I had to, to, to do some research and I found a lot of information. I usually make a list of the thing I found and I'm interested in add on the face and also on the dresses. Um, the drawings are coming from the thing I learned and I am focusing and make very simple drawings. Um, 
the most important to me as a director of the Puppet Workshop, the workshop is not intimidate the people helping us because there are people with different uh, skills and uh, also people goes and never did anything about um, mass or working with clay or even they don't know how to draw. So we have to think about everybody because this is an organization invited the community. So that is the reason why I really focus and make a simple drawings. Drawings, anybody can understand, kids can understand and recognize what is this. Next. Yeah, this was the second concept, biodiversity. I found the explanation, what is this, from a simple explanation. I read a lot of things, but I finally said, okay, I'm going to focus on the three different biodiversities. And the question is how I can show to the people in a parade all these concepts in a visual way. Um, you can see there are different elements according to the explanation. And I repeat, I like repetitions uh, because they can see the face. There are certain animals, um, many of the things that people can recognize and repeat again in the dress of the puppet. Remember, this is going to be a puppet. So in the, in the small drawing, I, I made uh, the puppeteer how this year the puppetry puppeteer is going to hold the the puppet next yeah so as soon uh, i have the the designs it's time to start the workshop i have uh, a chance to do 10 different sessions um four hours is each session so I organized <laughs> how, how many sessions I need for actually I made the face in clay. So the session one, two, three, and three Saturday, I must finish the modeling clay. So the first uh, picture show you how uh, we can make the structure where I have to add the clay in the top. The second picture show you how I really want to the voluntary start working. Definitely, we have people like I said before with different skills. I have uh, people real, they are artists. They had the the talent to make a nice face, but we have to remember we have people never did anything. So. I start from the beginnings, like, okay, do you know what this line is, vertical, horizontal? So we start with the shapes and lines over the oval face. Uh, that allow us uh, four or five people work in the same piece. After they define the, the geometric figure, they can start adding actually the real nose, but they, they already will have uh, a very, I, I cannot say symmetrical face, but like a face uh, friendly, most of the time is friendly face, um, but this is the way for many years working, I finally said this is the best, best way to work with many people or oh, many hands into the piece. Next picture, please. Okay. Uh, Lucrecia, real quick, I have to move yeah, on yeah. to the captain yeah, yeah. In the next. Very fast. The next uh, three to six session is paper mache. Next. Uh, seven session, we uh, add clay, uh, 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 gesso and we start working at the same time with the dress. Next one. Uh, session eight to nine is painting. Next one. Now I have to bring uh, the, the faces to homes at the same time working in the weekends on Saturday, but I have to work during the week actually painting the faces. Next one. Uh, also, 
so in the dresses, all the the painted, the volunteer made, they need to come through on the on the dress. Next one is last one. Next picture. Yeah, this is session number ten. So it's the time we have to assemble the dress and the face. Check the details. Here again is our friends Pedro and and Rosa. They were very hard. And that's it. Very Thank short. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Lucrecia. Um, all right. Okay, yes. Yeah. So as I said, our, um, the next person we'll be hearing from is Catherine Fraging. Um, she's an artist um, and has done multiple paintings for his celebrations. I'll let her tell you more about it. Um, so here is Catherine. Okay, you're gonna put up the slides, please. Yes, it's just loading, sorry. Okay, well, then I'll just say good evening and thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be able to be among all these wonderful artists and uh, activists and organizers. And um, I, I uh, generally do sustainable solutions and uh, programs for states and for the tri-state area and lower um, New England. For this group, I do straight educational media um, with, um, uh, with school children. Um, of course, Ecological City's objective is to promote and celebrate the sustainable solutions demonstrated in the gardens, the parks, rooftops, and on streets. And four years ago, we started collecting information and Im images to support this with conversations and images of the gardens. I compile that into black and white drawings that were then edited and painted by the neighborhoods. And we started with the 12 gardens to celebrate what their so sustainable solution was and um, I'll show you six, there's two, go on to the next of six of the gardens. And then the last, oh, but just to set, show you, see there's rainwater harvesting and composting and all the solutions we've already been talking about, go to the next. And then of course, people really enjoy them and feel strengthened and uh, propelled to do more. And that's great. So go to the next, please. So when the UN issued their list of sustainable development goals, we created a mandala, which has the um, colors that they uh, were using to, uh, to illustrate their solutions, their goals. Um, and then we applied a mandala on top of that, that um, reflects the actions, the solutions that are going on in our gardens. And then next slide, please. So here's the finished piece with the UN goals in the back, our sustainable solutions drawn on top. And then the labels, the black labels show where those solutions can be seen, what garden uh, will show that solution. Go to the next, please. So then we got bigger and we started to do a 40 foot mural. Um, since the East River, uh, River Park was being threatened and we created this mural to represent the sustainable solutions that it applied as it applied to the park and throughout the Lower East Side. Next. Here's, um, we can go through, these are six. This is one just shows uh, sort of a composite of all the gardens. These are all the components of the sustainable solutions in uh, from 22nd Street all the way down to uh, Cherry Street. Go to the next. And here's the Stuyvesant's Cove Park. And it has things like the, um, the berms and um, solar panels. Next, please. And then this is the lower side of section. Next, the uh, two bridges section. Next, 
and then what could be done in fact on the waterfront in terms of promoting uh, species and, and developing recreation. Next. And we paraded this around our pageant event. Next. And displayed it on the fences. Um, these were done in, um, these were actually painted in a number of, um, of, of centers uh, up and down the east side. Um, the, the Asser Levy Center, the Sixth Street Community Center, the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And um, they could be hung there again. So I'm actually looking for places for these to be shown more often. So um, think about that. Um, next. Uh, then um, during COVID, we started to do something that was um, a flag project. Uh, we created a mural that could easily be assembled and even mailed in and then mounted on fences for safely distanced passers-by. So we, I uh, can go to the next. So here is one of the fences and go to the next. No, you skipped one. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is the more like what it looked like to be more mural-like. Um, these were created to close to 200 students with about 30 different classes. So actually our outreach was bigger than it had ever been. Um, and the kids just really uh, picked up all the ideas of solutions uh, very clearly, go to the next. I like this one, reuse paper, bam, there it is. Kid knows what he's doing. Next. And here's one about pollinator gardens. So I'm not sure what our next project is gonna be, but I really enjoy reaching out to as many young minds as possible and making something meaningful for them. So we'll see what comes next, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, we're all excited to see um, what we do this year. Let's see here. I'll cancel your spotlight video. Great. Um, Felicia, would you like to? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll put, yeah, if you can put my presentation up, that'd be great. Yeah, okay, we'll move ahead to Felicia. Is Maggie sharing it? Should be. Did you want to um, introduce any of Soul's costumes? Um, no, I just want to go straight to the. Uh, we're running okay, out of time. Great. Um, great. So yeah, if you can go, I don't know if you can go just to the presentation. Yeah, if you. Okay, keep going. And as I speak, just keep moving at, ahead. Um, yeah. Keep going. So um, for those of you who are new to this um, project, basically it takes nine months of organizing from the planning meetings that we used to do in person that are now online to um, the workshops that start up in the spring and run for three months. And as you can see with all the climate solutions that we were talking about, if you looked at a bird's eye view, what we're talking about here are all these climates, okay, can slow down all the climate solutions between the gardens, which were pollinator gardens, water harvesting ponds, you have uh, rain barrels and water, and water catchment, um, you've got compost and solar microgrids. Um, there are so many solutions from the bioswales that Charles had talked about earlier um, to even wetlands projects. And of course, you know, the elements of carbon sequestration and air filtration. So there's so many things that we can celebrate within the gardens and the green infrastructure that are really providing these solutions and they're not imagined, they're real, they exist on a community level. And, you know, we need to affirm and bring more attention to the fact that these living solutions exist. If you connect that to what's happening in the neighborhood and the waterfront, um, you can also see the importance of how these local solutions are connecting 
to our global goals. So New York City has signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement, which means we need to um, help contribute to the lowering of the global warming temperatures. And to do that, we need to amplify um, these solutions and get going on them. So we shouldn't be fighting to save gardens anymore. There should be much more support um, for all of these initiatives because these initiatives are meeting the goals that the city has already set. Um, okay, so keep going. Um, so here you see um, a lot of the solutions outlined, as I said before, bioswales, pollinator gardens, permeable surfaces, sidewalks, um, which help mitigate and absorb the floods, waters, um, and how we bring all of these solutions together are through the visuals. You can keep going forward. Um, so every year we come up with what are the new concepts we're gonna add. Uh, we reuse our existing costumes and um, our puppets, and then try to think what are the new issues that are going on in the neighborhood and what new projects would be important. So for those of you, okay, you can slow down. For those of you who are new to this, the pageant itself is about five hours long. It goes to 20 different sites from the gardens to neighborhood sustainability sites over to the East River Park waterfront. And so every site that gets visited in this urban ecological pilgrimage celebrates one of the local solutions that's actually site specific and being developed out of that location. So many people will just walk by a garden and they don't really understand or they don't see what that solution is or they'll walk by the harvesting pond but they don't make that connection. And it's such an important connection to make between what's happening on a local level as well as the global um, climate and what we're actually doing about it within the neighborhood. So all of these ideas are brought together between the workshops and the visuals that we create. And the pageant comes together with this procession that has the puppets, it has costumes, it has music. And then at each of the 20 sites, there are performances that are small, like three to five minute performances that celebrate through music, dance, theater, and poetry that site-specific climate solutions. So people go on this journey that is told through art, music, theater, and dance, and the community gets to tell its inspiring story of this ecosystem of climate solutions. Um, so you can keep going. You'll see the workshops with Katie. These were ones where we use natural paint and natural dyes. Besides the workshops that we do at our celebrations, we also reach out to schools and community centers. There are over 50 community partners in the end that come together and contribute, whether it's visual work or performance work um, that gets presented in the pageant. And it's really something that everybody can somehow join in and be a part of. Some, we also do artist partner collaborations where we've had artists work more intensely with a specific group through several workshops to create dance pieces that are also site specific and exploring um, different solutions. Um, so now keep going. You will see how, is that the end? Oh, there. Yeah, so keep going as I speak. So for those of you who are new to this, this is what the procession looks like. Maybe you, these are the spectacular puppets that get developed um, and people join in, you know, moving from site to site. We bring in these issues like fighting, you know, with the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project and people painted um, this sort of cardboard signs. So it was a way that we could put signage and messages in, but they were all hand done. There's just a lot of intricate work being done by hundreds of people within the community um, to tell this story publicly. Keep going, please. Can you go to the next? Yeah, keep going to the next. I just have to try to move quickly through it. So there, here is the bioremediation sculpture. Um, uh, it goes on a pedicab all day long until we get to the end where it gets offered to the river. 
Here are more examples of Lucrezia's amazing puppets. Um, keep going. Can you go to the next? Maggie? Yeah, just keep going fast through this. Okay, uh, it's just to give people a sense of what the pageant is, especially for those people who are new. So just keep flipping through, you'll see the procession, people engaging, the people who participate in the workshops are obviously doing more in-depth research um, into the issues. And then this collaborative comes together and the community participates in the journey to all of these sites. So every year we try to figure out, you know, what, what are the news stories that need to be told? Um, keep going, please. Um, so this one that was Michelle's costume is climate consequences with floods and fires. Um, keep going. Maggie? Yep, you can just move quickly through it. Yeah, I mean, not that quickly, but... <laughs> Um, we have ceremonies where each of the gardeners will offer water, a symbol of the water that gets um, filtered rather than flowing with pollution runoff into the river, the water is absorbed. Um, we celebrate renewable energy projects in the neighborhood, everything from solar microgrids, like Ross was talking about doing now the, their solar project. There were also community solar projects on rooftops, as well as so, solar microgrids that were going into some of the gardens so they could be off the grid. Um, then we would celebrate the solar energy project. This is Lower East Side Girls Club did a song for solar. Yeah, I think it was Here Comes the Sun. Um, yeah, so every year different groups come forward and help create um, the pageant. Um, here were some of the amazing puppets again. Keep going. And integrated into all of the sites are these solutions. So, you know, if you look carefully at the pageant, you're going to see, keep going, visuals of uh, these solutions that get celebrated. Um, there are those amazing puppets that got created. Um, keep going. Can you go to the next? Yeah, just keep flipping through. I think you see there's bioswales, water harvesting ponds, renewable energy there in the garden. Keep going, please. Um, celebrating Green Oasis as a pollinator garden. Kids dressed up as bees and ladybugs. We had a Buto dance that celebrated pollinators. There are costumes that also celebrate it. Keep going. Keep going, please. Yeah, so just keep flipping through, thank you. So as the procession moves to these different sites, some of the gardens will be a professional performance. Other times it's a gardener who might be singing. Sometimes it's somebody just telling the story. There are a whole contingent from Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space who played pollution pirates every year and attacked the nature spirits but we went out in the end every year. Um, we celebrate the garden for its healing values um, and what it contributes. And people create all sorts of ceremonies. Um, we even have opera and poetry that highlights different um, solutions at these sites. Keep going. Um, this is at 6th and B where we're standing in front of the water harvesting pond and one of the gardeners dressed up as a giant drop of water um, with the singer that sings a water song and the earth school kids. Well, you can stop there for one second. So the earth school has an, a green roof and of course people walk past and they don't see the green roof. But by doing this 
ceremony and involving the students, it was really some way that they could share what they're contributing to that people often miss because it's on the roof of their school. Okay. Uh, Sixth Street Community Center every year creates a performance with their youth. So it's with costumes, they've celebrated, they have a, a bee farm on the rooftop. So they've celebrated that and their communities supported agricultural program. Let, one year they created a performance about zero waste. Um, so every year it's involving youth and really engaging them to learn about these solutions and also help tell the story to the community. Um, keep going. Yeah, you can keep going fast so we can get through this. Yeah, just keep going through. Okay, we're getting to, this is the waterfront. There are five performances along the waterfront, all celebrating coastal resiliency, um, telling the story of surviving Hurricane Sandy. It involved some of the residents who lived in the NYCHA buildings um, and actually experienced Hurricane Sandy and other youth that wanted to protest the new um, Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project that would close down the park. We have Stewards of the River, which are different organization representatives working on the river who get honored um, for their work, work and their contributions. Um, we celebrate everything from what's happening along the riverfront to what's happening in the river itself, as well as many of the solutions that you even heard Paul Mankiewicz, um, you know, speak about in terms of wetlands and oyster and mussels and oyster plantings to organically cleanse the river. We do a ceremony where um, dancers are there with oyster planting nets along the river. Keep going, thanks. Can you keep going? And then the bioremediation sculpture gets offered to the river at the end of the day. So um, it, can you just go back to the last slide with the bridge? Because I don't know if people, so this was really beautiful. I mean, 2019 was a magical year and Dee Dee made the bioremediation sculpture and it magically floated and floated past the Brooklyn Bridge and you know, normally it's very, you can't predict something like that. So it really was one of these amazing things. We didn't know if it would sink or float, but then it just sailed away as far as we could see. So um, anyway, that's the overview. So um, yeah, let's go back to grid view. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, since we're running late, Hannah, why don't we just try to close it out? And I would say to people who have questions where, you know, you can um, reach back out to us. Um, we're gonna have another meeting in February. Um, if anybody has a really pressing thing they wanna ask or say, why don't you ask it now very briefly because we've run over time. And then we're gonna do this group collaborative um, movement and put our photos up of nature. So everyone should have a photo of nature on their phone, hold it horizontally. Um, but does anyone, Hannah, you wanna ask if anyone has any quick question? Yeah, if anyone has any pressing questions, otherwise I'll give an introduction into our closing movement in collaborative collage here. Anything pressing? Great. Um, you have our information. And like I said, well, we have been recording this meeting so that will be sent out to those if you wish to review. Again, with our closing movement, I'm gonna be playing a song um, called Super Nature. We're gonna play it for a little bit, let it play. Um, and then if you have a picture of nature up on your phone, um, you have it ready. And we're gonna listen to the music. Then we're gonna sway our hands left so, or at least to this side of the screen, hands to the other side of the screen. Um, and then if we're able to do like a turn, it's hard, I know we're all sitting or you can even turn, yeah, turn your arms. <laughs> 
and then we'll we'll bring up the picture of nature and you put it in front of your camera mm -hmm. so that we'll all get a collective collage okay okay so i'm going to start the music here everyone get your photos ready Science opened up the door We would feed the hungry thieves Till they couldn't eat no more But the portions that we made Touched the creatures down below Great. Thank you everyone so much. Um, and thank you so much for coming to the meeting. Felicia, do you have any closing words? Um, yeah, for any of the new people, you know, especially if you want to be involved in the workshops or if you were one of the people from Kuala Lumpur to Hawaii and Australia, um, you know, stay in touch with us. Maybe there's a way we can figure out um, some other kind of visuals that could be contributed remotely or sent in or somehow shared on Facebook. Um, maybe you can do a ceremony in your own community and on that day we can share it on our Facebook page. And um, yeah, since we have people around the world who may want to be doing similar actions in their own communities. Great, awesome. Well, thank you everyone so much. We'll go ahead and close out the meeting. Um, appreciate everyone coming out. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>